and I do want to say this disclaimer before we begin. We are pretty smart people, but I will tell you this, everything changes every day with AI. Every day, every hour, there's something new, there's something different out there. So I just want to make sure that everyone understands these are some really intelligent, very smart, very educated individuals on our roundtable today. But things change constantly. So what we say today may be slightly different tomorrow. Uh, if we had this last week, our conversation would be a little bit different. Um, but things are all constantly changing in the world of AI. So I just want to make sure I put that disclaimer out there before we begin our discussion today, brought to you by Future Ready Schools. And I have to also give an amazing shout out to AWS, our sponsor for today's roundtable. But um, without any further ado, I, let me introduce myself, everybody. My name is Dr. Adam File. I am the Director of Professional Learning and Leadership for All for Ed. And I am joined today, I have the honor, the privilege to be joined by some amazing individuals, as I mentioned earlier. Um, I'm just going to uh, hopefully not butcher anybody's names. Uh, I know when I'm going to do it, I'm a butcher, and, and I, I'm going to try my best to say it the correct way. He told me how to say it. I'm going to try my best to say it. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and start off with uh, Sarah Thomas, Dr. Sarah Thomas. If you could let everybody know uh, who you are, which, where they can find you, and a little bit about yourself. All right. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Adam. Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Thomas. Um, I am the founder of an organization called EduMatch that creates grassroots connections between educators uh, along similar lines of interest. Uh, by day, I also uh, I also work in a very large school district. However, I'm here today representing EduMatch, um, and I'm super excited to be here with you all. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. We are so excited to have you a part of today's uh, conversation around AI. Okay. Jean, Jens, I know I messed that up. Did I, was that close? Was that close? Pretty, pretty close. Pretty close. Okay. Yes. Yes. Ah, <laughs> that was not close. That was not close. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. Uh, thank you for, for inviting me. So, yes, I'm Jens and I'm the CEO and one of the founders of uh, CurryPod. And what we do in CarePod is that we help teachers make uh, interactive lessons focused on 21st century skills, and we make it with AI. So in 10 seconds, you can get a lesson about any topic in the world. Um, and as I'm sure we will be discussing here, and you all know, AI is not perfect. So it's a learning journey for us as well as, as our users. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. I'm from Norway. So I'm based in Oslo now. So Central European time for the time zones. Um, <laughs> really looking forward to this uh, discussion. All right, thank you for joining us today. Uh, next, we have uh, Del Rose. Hello, everyone. My name is Del Rose Adkinson, and I am part of a team of 24 instructional technology coaches who serve 28,000 students and over 2,000 staff members at 43 schools in Newport News, Virginia. And as instructional technology coaches, we're in classrooms every day, partnering with teachers to purposefully integrate technology into teaching and learning to both improve the teacher's practice and student learning outcomes. And I am excited about AI in K-12 education as I would be about any other technology tool that enhances student learning. And so I believe that personalized learning is one of the most equitable methods of instruction. And so I'm excited about the affordances of AI to make personalized learning a daily practice in classrooms across our district. So I'm excited to be with you all today. Thank you for joining us. All right, next we have uh, Alex. Hey everybody, I'm Alex Catron, uh, co-founder and CEO of the AI Education Project. We're, we're a nonprofit. We uh, basically work are working to make AI literacy, foundational AI education, um, part of every single student's K-12 education. Like we, I think, I used to say we believe this is going to be as big or bigger than the internet. I think if you've used GPT-4, it's really obvious that we're on the cusp of a technology that is going to change the world within within years, not Within, within months, not years. Um, so doing a lot of work to both build curriculum to figure out how do we actually teach students about the technology in an accessible way. So without the need for uh, for um, uh, computer science teachers so that we can reach Title I schools. Um, and in the, beginning, in the beginning of March, we announced a call to action for AI education with 
over 50 partners. Um, you can check out our website. I'm not going to name drop everybody, but it's uh, you know, a lot of big organizations, including Future Ready Schools, um, basically working to figure out how do we support school districts to make this happen? Because there's a really vibrant ecosystem of nonprofits and funders and universities looking to do that. Um, sorry, it was a bit long, but really excited to be here. And it's a really big uh, audience. I'm, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Once again, thank you for being a part of this. And as mentioned earlier, um, everything today will be recorded. So if you have to step out, I know everyone has working and somebody may call you or whatever, don't worry, it'll be recorded. You can watch it at a later date. Um, as stated earlier, I also want to thank our sponsor, AWS, for help helping to facilitate this conversation around AI. All right, so we're going to just dive right into it. We have a lot of educators um, on the line today, and we just want to have a just a general conversation around this this whole AI thing. So, what we're going to talk about right now is for all the educators who are interested in utilizing AI in their spaces. The question we're going to start with is: What knowledge or skills should educators have to integrate AI in the classroom? So do I need to go to school, get another degree? I mean, what, what is this all about? Because I'm seeing things, it's confusing. Do I need to ask AI what skills I need to use AI? I mean, I don't know. Is that kind of like looking into a mirror, into a mirror? I mean, we're going down this, this cycle here. So panelists, please hop in um, and let's add to this conversation. Uh, Sarah, do you want to start us off here? Sure, yeah, totally. So I would say that with these... Uh, newer models of technology and these newer products that that we have available, such as GPT 3.5, GPT 4, then it's very, very user friendly. Like there's some people, for example, you know, I post about it all the time on Facebook because <laughs> to me, this is just like mind blowing what we've been able to do just in a relatively short time. And some of my admittedly, self-admittedly non-tech savvy uh, folks that I'm connected with, you know, when they give it a shot, then they're just like, oh yeah, you know, I got this. And it's just, um, you know, it's based on natural language. So you just kind of type in what you need and then it gives you an output and then you can refine based on whatever it gives you. But in addition to that, um, I would say that one skill that would be very helpful would be, um, you know, being, uh, I've been reading a lot about prompt engineering. So being able to ask the right questions um, because it it can do a lot of things for you, but it can't do everything for you. You need to know what you're going in, what you're looking for and being able to ask it correct questions and also being able to maybe level up and, and learn how to use the API. I'm not there yet myself, but there are, you know, different things that you can do uh, with the resources provided. There's different Chrome extensions you can use, et cetera. So being able to integrate all of these things will help you get the most out of it. And I would say like every other successful ad tech tool, AI and the, the AIs that I've seen, the tools that I've seen appeal to ease of use, right? And so um, as Jens would probably say, right? Ease of use is, is top priority, right? Because if uh, um, someone uses your product and it's difficult for them to navigate, they're probably not going to give it a second try. And busy educators don't have time to figure out things. And so I think just like with Google, right? You get what you put in, but folks have learned over years what prompts will yield the best results, right, Sarah? So I think these AI tools that I have seen have really low floor, very high ceiling, and there's a entry point for every learner. And so I, I, I encourage educators or anyone to just jump in and learn what, what it can do for you. Because usually that's where I start with teachers, like how can I make their life easier? And when they see the productivity value of technology, they then they start thinking about the instructional value and the learning value, right? But start with what can it do for me and, and learn that way. And then you can move on small bites and move on and let, let the, 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 you know, what I say, the um, pioneers, everybody can go at their own pace. When we see on Twitter or on Facebook and we see people are using it for different things, don't let that intimidate you. Don't let that 
speed you up beyond your natural pace. Go at your pace and you'll find a place. Yeah, Bell Rose, as you say, ease of use. I think that's, uh, that's our responsibility as providers, <laughs> making products that are actually pleasurable and easy to use. Um, I think if I would pick one thing for teachers to know, I think it is the fact that they don't have to be afraid and specifically like afraid for their jobs, because this is something I see in use all of the, every day. My feed is full like, oh, AI is coming for our jobs. I'm like, no. <laughs> I mean, we all saw what happened during COVID uh, when students uh, sat alone uh, um, without the, the human part. So I think just first, like, let your shoulders down. <laughs> we really need teachers and we will always be needing teachers. Uh, and I think in that, when you know that, it's easier also to open up and look at the possibilities. Uh, the second thing I think is is important is actually what like AI you do is is providing, and that is content around AI so that we can teach students about AI because it's here and it's here no matter if we want it or not. And it has actually been there for quite some time, which I'm sure uh, as well AI Edu has been going for some time and trying to scream AI. <laughs> it's here. It's it's important. Um, and the, the third thing is uh, related to, sort of related to the, the prompting, but the output, just to so know that like when using AI, it might be factual mistakes and it might have bias and that's okay, as long as you know it and you look, look at it with the lens that it might contain these two parts. I think those, those three things would be my top choice. Um, I actually don't have much more to add beyond what Sarah said, I think. It, don't underestimate how user-friendly these tools are going to be. Um, even prompt engineering may be less and less important once we have tools that are tailored to the use case. So like by way of example, I, I wrote like five grant proposals, like 10 page grant proposals, um, like 90% of the text was written by GPT-4. And it's not that there were just like only a handful of mistakes and I had to tweak it like it was perfect, like 99% on target. Um, and but what I did was I fed, you know, all of the, the prior data. I spent time. It, was, it wasn't like 5% of the time. I spent, let's say, 40% of the time because I spent a lot of time building the prompts. Um, so that's it shouldn't take too much for people to figure out what those, you know, uh, how, to, how to basically utilize the tools. The key is going to be, are they getting the chance to actually get exposure? Um, because we can't rely on people sort of organically navigating online and figuring this stuff out for themselves. I, I really agree with Del Rose on that, where, you know, we have to create these sort of guided moments where we're not just saying, hey, you can use these tools, but showing them very specific use cases. And that applies for teachers and students, right? Like you have to build almost like a pedagogy around how these tools are rolled out. Um, but they're going to be easy enough to use that that project will be relatively easy rel compared to if you think of something like coding, which you know, you're know you talking weeks to months to get a teacher proficient uh, to be ready to teach coding. Um, I also, you know, to give you by, by way of example, um, there's a company that uh, a former CZI uh, program manager launched called Brisk Education. I dropped it in the chat. And what you'll see is like, this is kind of what, where the future is heading is you have a super app where you can exempt a student from a worksheet. You can, you know, uh, uh, rewrite news articles at different reading levels, um, you know, draft emails to parents. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of like really, really useful stuff that teachers are probably perhaps even more than students. Um, some of the data from Walton suggests that teachers are using ChatGPT more than students are. Um, so I believe in teachers. I think, I think educators are going to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's funny you mention that because I can think about so many times when we're, teachers are asked to give that authentic feedback to students, and it's often been a struggle uh, getting beyond the good job, keep up the good work. If you can have the uh, uh, an AI generate some of those responses based on the student understanding, I think that's when you can try to get uh, you know the most out of AI for an educator side. But we, we kind of talked about this a little bit and when some of those answers that you gave. Um, 
I, I would like to ask everyone, what are some potential risk and ethical considerations that educators need to keep in mind with AI? Uh, because I, we've talked about chat GPT, but there's there are different AI tools and resources that are out there. So AI and chat GPT are not the same. Uh, it is a form of it, but it's not, you know, it's not the only type of AI that's out there. So what are some things that educators should keep in mind uh, for the ethical considerations when they are using it in their spaces? Well, I think it's the same considerations that educators need to keep in mind for any technology tool. I think it's important to for folks to understand that AI is just another tool. It's just another tech tool. And so um, just like a teacher would be conscious of her student, his or her students' privacy information being leveraged by companies to then turn around and sell, right, to those, to those students, AI is the same way. I mean, we, we know the typical, the data biases, right? The, the algorithm, al algorithmic biases, the lack of transparencies. I mean, you know, Jens would say that's his product and he's going to protect um, his product, which requires that he, you know, not, not let some things out of the bag, but um, that lack of transparency has another side to it. Um, the possibility for personal information to be misused in, in ways that AI just amplifies, right? So someone could use AI to amplify the misuse of personal information or even misinformation. So I think the, the, the considerations and the limitations of AI are very typical to a lot of the tech tools that are already in use. Yeah, Delrose, you touch on uh, <laughs> a very important topic, which is uh, it's the hot uh, hot potato in our office. Uh, the trade off, you know, between transparency and and the business considerations of of sharing exactly how things work, and I think that's just a continuous uh, struggle in one way. Uh, but I think the privacy side is, at least from a vendor perspective, it is quite easy to solve is just about making a decision around it. Uh, so, I mean, in our case, like we don't share any data, like no student or teacher data is used for training the model. Um, of course, that might be changed change in the future, of course, and then we'll make sure that that's properly informed about. Um, uh, but yeah, the, the biases and other than that, as you say, it's a, it's a new tool and you need to do the same considerations as you do with any other tool. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll say I, I have like two sort of contrarian things, um, but I should lead with- bring, bring the contrarian, I want it, bring it, bring it. I'm very concerned about the, the the risk of bias. I think like one of, you know, one of the things that when I first was developing my opinion about this, I was reading about a company called GoGuardian. You probably, many of you have heard of GoGuardian. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just thinking about, you know, well, do they share data on kids browsing history in Florida with administration? Like do other protections for uh, LGBTQ students um, who might be, you know, who administrators might be, might be notified about? Um, it felt very minority report, you know, like we're, we're literally flagging students before they commit, you know, <clears throat> actual actions. So there, there's a lot of like, like really, really uncomfortable uh, things, and I think part of that will be all about deciding what, when to use the AI. Because I think if we just assume that oh, we're going to do our best to address bias, like we should assume we're going to fail, and so we're going to probably have to make some decisions about when is a tool, even though it's useful, maybe just not. You know, the risk is too high. Um, but the contrarian thing is, you know, when I've talked to teachers in you know, some of the most underserved schools, some of the most diverse schools, um, you know, their, their take on something like GoGuardian was, you know, we just had, and this is a case in Firestone High School where my, where my mom used to teach. Um, uh, in 2022, they had three uh, instances where a student brought a gun onto the premises. Um, and so when you think about like, you know, for, for, for those educators, they were like, that is the, our biggest challenge with learning. Like that is the thing that is disadvantaging these kids is because if you go to this school and you're always worried about 
you know, the threat of violence, like how can you possibly learn? Um, I think there's gonna be a lot of instances where the benefits of AI may be actually very important to communities that, that are currently being left behind. You think about the teacher shortage, um, personalized learning, you know, means we could have a high quality, like a really high quality tutor available to every student uh, in a district. Um, that currently does not exist in a lot of places. And there's a lot of kids just sitting after school with an English teacher, struggling with their math homework, and they have nobody to help them. Um, so, you know, that's, that's, a, I mean, I think there's an ethical question about is there eventually going to be a responsibility to be using tools that we know are going to be able to help kids bridge gaps? Um, but it's, I don't know, I, I'm curious, I don't know if anybody else on the panel has like a sense of, is there going to be a, how do we figure out that balance? Because you're, you're kind of operating on these technologies are moving really quickly. And so you're making decisions about capabilities today without really knowing what the future is going to hold. And at that point, it may be hard to sort of unwind. I think, uh, oh, sorry, please go first. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. You, um, you kind of segued into one of the points I was going to make, Alex, um, about how, um, you know, as Delrose said, this is another tool that has been, you know, that is now available. And we've seen about the inequities um, in ways that technology has been integrated um, in various schools. You know, we we have the, the digital use divide, you know, where a lot of times um, some schools may um, be, you know, they, they may encourage technology integration in a way to help students build their capacity, whereas another school may decide to use it for more drill and kill type things. And when we come to these um, to these new innovations. Um, and I mean, like, like y'all said, AI is not new. People have been talking about it since the fifties and working on it, you know, since shortly after that. Um, however, you know, with our world changing as quickly as it is, then the digital use divide is, is definitely at the forefront of one thing that I'm concerned about. Um, I know that you all also spoke about, uh, bias and I, I, I second and third and fourth that um, in terms of bias. And one other thing that I would uh, that I would mention would be about the over-reliance. I know that right now we, um, and when I say we, I'm talking about we as society, there are lots of members of society who kind of struggle with digital literacy and finding things online um, and taking things as facts when they may not be. And in using uh, various AI tools, um, I'll, I'll, I'll go to chat GPT just because that's like my, my go-to right now. Um, a lot of times, especially in 3.5, this is a little better now in four, uh, but in 3.5, it would be very loud and very wrong. And a lot of times, you know, um, if there's not those digital literacy skills about them, people can just take that and run with it, um, saying, hey, you know, I found it here, so it must be true. So that's that's one thing. Um, and in addition to that, um, I actually did have another point, but it just kind of went away from me. But um, but those those are just a few things that are at the top of my mind right now. Yeah, I see a comment here from Kate it's saying something about anything coming from a human has a bias as well. Mm -hmm. So that's, of course, the, the flip side of it. And I think what you mentioned, Alex, the, the trade-off between, on the one hand, like we want the equity, we want the personalized, personalized learning. And in the extreme, you could say like, oh, yeah, put a, put a tutor, digital AI tutor, just teaching the student. Uh, and then you get all the biases and the problem. And on the other hand, you have not using the tool at all. And this is something we've been We've been working a lot on, obviously. And like, for example, now we're, we just released a feature where it's basically a hybrid, right? Where the teacher is actually the important part in between. So every student get a write in an answer to the question, write the sentence about yourself in Spanish, everyone writes in, and then the AI generate the feedback based on the criteria the teacher puts in. And the teacher can look through it before the teacher sends it out. So like still giving the teacher the control uh, and the pace uh, to kind of be that, uh, be that control mechanism. Uh, so I think there are ways to solve it. I'm not sure we've solved it the best way yet. We'll see now. We get mm -hmm. feedback from educators and we'll improve on it. Um, but there are definitely lots of opportunities there. 
But it's just, just like I said earlier when we first started, we don't have all the answers to this stuff because there's no way to have the answers because it's coming out as we speak during this conversation. There's things that are working on. Somebody's releasing a brand new AI to help a science teacher that's out there. So there's constantly things that are coming out or around this. And I I did have a, a, a question I wanted to ask everybody. Um, and you really prompted it uh, around this AI. When we talk about getting access to AI to our students and how can we ensure that all students of all backgrounds have access to it? Because what we ultimately don't want to have happen is this divide continue. Because we talk about uh, the connectivity divide. We talk about the uh, divide in, in access. Uh, we talk about a divide that happens in classroom settings where some students don't get that high uh, engaging instruction. I think, Sarah, you mentioned drill and kill. So as we start moving forward with a tool like uh, AI, chat, GPT, CurePod, all these tools that are out there, what can educators do to ensure that it's equitable in the use in education? I think your that question probably addresses the leadership, right? The district leadership, because in the classroom, if a teacher is using an artificial intelligence tool, then all her students have access, his or her students have access to um, AI in that way. Um, but I think to, to Sarah's point, when decisions are made at a district level to where certain schools are allowed to engage in certain instructional behaviors, while other schools, it's not allowed, um, I think that's where the controls can be put in place to ensure equity of access and equity of use, mm -hmm. right? Um, and if if uh, educators, leaders, um, whether in the classroom or at the district level, don't educate themselves in how to best use these tools to support the kind of learning that the jobs of the future is gonna require, then we are gonna see those drill and kill type situations in the lower performing schools, the schools that don't squeak enough to get the attention, right? And so I think that's that's where educational leadership and policies at the school board level will will address some of those um, concerns. Yeah, I can comment comment on this as well. And I think obviously I think I think it's a shared responsibility <laughs> across many levels, uh, like beginning with you know infrastructure, internet devices. I mean, without them, <laughs> it will be hard to implement technology. And then school leaderships, as you mentioned, Elros. And then I think as vendors, we also have a, have a responsibility, right? There are many ways to offer a product. Uh, we try as good as we can to have a model where it can be used a lot on the free plan to actually make it accessible. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope, I hope many, uh, many other AI companies as well choose that path. Uh, and that has, of course, trade-offs. Uh, you need to make sure with, you still have, uh, data privacy, all of these things. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I think we can be a part of that that solution as well. I was just, I was just gonna say like, we, this is, so AI EDU literally is, uh, was founded to answer this question. Um, See, I teed it up for you. Yeah, you really did. I mean, so <laughs> we started with the landscape analysis back in 2019. So we were wearing the, you know, the shirt before the band was cool. I mean, we've been advocating for AI education since for four years. Um, and we started with landscape analysis to understand, you know, how our students, because I was sort of work, you know, in politics and the Obama administration came out to San Francisco, was working for tech companies and AI companies, and um, we're just sort of getting deeper, deeper into the AI space. And at that time, you know, companies like Google were already saying that AI is the new electricity. And so you had people within the sort of tech ecosystem pretty convinced that this is the future and that it's going to be really disruptive. Um, and so... But when we looked at like how our, you know, and I literally had a conversation with my mom where I was like telling her about some conference I petted and she was like, oh, it's, artificial intelligence is so interesting. I wish my kids were were learning about that. And I was like, what do you mean? You teach, you know, math students in, you know, Akron early college high school. It's like Akron is one of the most, you know, cities that are most at risk for, for automation, uh, job displacement. Um, but it turns out that's actually a sort of uh, that the that the the rule, not the exception. Like most schools in the U.S. today, still don't have AI curriculum. There's no there's there's very little 
uh, standards aligned curriculum out there. Um, there are some standards, like we helped write standards in Ohio, but writing standards, as you know, does not mean that suddenly every school has the curriculum in the school. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done. And, you know, we started, we, we see the problem as sort of two prongs. So the first is you have to have accessible standards aligned curriculum that's modular, that can work in four subjects, um, and that doesn't require extensive or any PD to implement. Because uh, the minute you have an, a PD barrier uh, to entry, um, then it's just it's very slow. And that's sort of the, the challenge that computer science education has struggled with. Um, but the good thing about AI is that it connects with so many subjects, it connects with every subject. And like by way of example, you have a an English class debating the use of chat GPT in journalism or a US history class talking about, you know, what would students put into their AI Bill of Rights. So you can use AI ethics as actually a bridge for students that don't necessarily have that technical background. Um, and we have, you know, hundreds of thousands of students using these activities. And they're are very often in Title I schools. All the schools that we built and piloted in were Title I schools, um, diverse, very poor, uh, low resource, sort of the classic schools that you would, would expect to be left behind by all of this. And they're actually the first schools in the country to be doing this. Gwinnett County, um, awesome. our partners, that's Greater Atlanta. Um, and they pioneered one of the first a integrated AI education strategies. Um, so this is actually an opportunity. It's an opportunity for schools that have often been seen as falling behind to actually play a leadership role um, in our view. So I'll stop there. But we're obviously very excited about this specific problem and solving it. Absolutely. Yeah, I love everything. Um, all of the great points that you all have made. Um, I just wanted to also shout out Dwight Carter in the chat was saying, train current and future school leaders to use AI and other digital tools. Um, the quote, everything rises and falls on leadership. I love that point. Um, I know that Alex was just talking about like PD, how PD should not be a factor in, you know, integrating the technology. However, I feel like it, it the opportunity for professional learning on it can help us to deepen our practices and to to help them uh, to help integrate it even more effectively. So um, you all pretty much nailed what what I was going to say. The only other thing that I would add, I want to give a huge shout out to Dr. Nicole Howard over at University of Redlands in uh, California. And a lot of times she talks about um, students being able to see themselves in avatars and um, in terms of culturally relevant content, culturally relevant pedagogy. Um, and this is no exception when it comes to AI. Um, you know, as Katie was saying in the chat, then anything human created can have a bias to it. So we want to make sure that all of our students feel safe um, regarding whatever AI tool that is, you know, that that they are utilizing and uh, that they see themselves reflected in there as well. And to your point, Sarah, um, as professional development providers, you know, we're oftentimes on the front lines of innovation and education. Um, I can speak uh, for our team of instructional technology coaches. We have been having conversations among ourselves and trying to really grapple with our own beliefs about where AI fits into our practice. And so I, I think about how can we prepare ourselves to build teachers' capacity to effectively integrate AI tools to increase the level of personalization they can facilitate in their classrooms. And as I said, personalized learning is a passion of mine, and that's why I'm excited about these AI tools um, to the extent that they can increase the level of personalization that happens in classroom, I'm all for it. Um, of course, being mindful of the risk and you know the things that we need to be considerate of. Um, so to that end, I think you know what opportunities can we provide to support teachers to reflect on these leaps, right? These jerks mm -hmm. in 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 technology, and how these these I call them hard stops and and pull offs are affecting their teacher identity and what they believe about teaching and learning in the age of AI, right? How, how do we provide a space for teachers to, to think about how do they feel about it, right? Collect the information, collect the facts and give them space to consider their own feelings and how it affects what they, who they thought they were as teachers 
and how these external pressures are affecting those that those identities and what shifts and changes they need to make in their practice to be true to to their students to their charge to prepare them for this world so those are the things that m- our team of ITCs have been talking about and thinking about and building our own capacity and supporting each other in questioning, right? Where does this fit in our practice? And and when we interact with teachers, how do we present these tools in such a way that welcomes them in, doesn't scare them, but also are truthful and honest about their limitations and the problems that exist with them. So let me ask you this. I'm I'm not one to like go with the newest technology trend that's out there and, and grab it and 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 show it off. That's not me. I'm not that person. So, you know, these things come and go. It's the flavor of the month. You know, Facebook spent like a, a billion dollars on on this uh AI virtual stuff. They said this was going to be the next wave. You're not really hearing so much about it right now. So is AI just like that? Is that going to be the flavor of the month? Is this going to go away and we're going to be like, oh, yeah, I remember we talked about AI was the thing for a couple of months? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I hope it just keeps getting better and better. At a conference last week, the, uh, the keynote speaker said, this is the worst version of chat GPT that we will be exposed to or CurePod or any of the other Dolly or any of the other tools that are coming out. Like it's just going to get even more um, amplified. And I think where we are right now, I I would say one of the best things we can do for educators and students is to prepare them through. And I think Alex said in the chat, you know, we talked about all the literacies. We talked about financial literacy, informational literacy, digital literacy, all of these literacies. And we really need to put some muscle behind digital informational literacy and helping folks to to use these tools in a way that's beneficial. And that's not, not only beneficial for themselves and their practice, but beneficial for their communities and the go- the global community. And so you know, how can we prepare folks to really leverage these tools in the best way possible? And that's kind of where we are as a team right now. Thanks for adding to that, because that's one of the things that I I kind of hear people wonder, is this just the flavor of the month? But um, as Sarah mentioned, and it was in the conversation, AI has been around for a long time. A lot of us have been using AI. Anybody use Grammarly? Machine learning. I mean, it's there. Um, how many of you remember way back in the day, this thing called Clippy? Anybody remember that? <laughs> I was I was in a chat group and somebody was uh, joking and they said literally chat GPT and the leap we've made in AI has turned Siri and Alexa into Clippy now. It's kind of dated it so fast just based on the features and the things that individuals are able to do with it. So let me ask the panel um, another question um, with, with AI, uh, getting back on this. So how can AI be used to personalize learning experiences for students? I know we we mentioned that earlier, but right now, what are the limitations with that? Because we all have these statements in our school system. I call them the all statements, you know, educational excellence for all. We will support all students, the best versions of themselves, so on and so forth. But it's pretty difficult to do with one teacher with 30 plus students in the classroom. So how can AI be used to customize learning? And right now as it stands, what are the limitations utilizing it? So I'll start in, in our district, we have a, a professional development course called PLOT, Personalized Learning Opportunities with Technology. And uh, we facilitated a couple cohorts of that course. And what I have what I have found and what I'm excited about is the the like you said earlier adam and and yens teachers aren't going anywhere right um so how do we help teachers to personalize the learning experience of of students but harness the power of technology and the efficiencies that technology affords to increase those personalized learning experiences so there are lots of teachers who want to right, join the personalized learning train. But when you think about 30 students in the classroom, 
and uh, personalizing learning for 30 individual students, that is daunting. And that makes personalized learning sort of like an, a utopian idea or um, some sort of private school <laughs> or some school out in the bush somewhere, um, that idea. But I, I get excited about how can we leverage technology to um, really personalize students' learning and, and get the, the idea that the teacher has and use the power of technology to realize that idea. So, because there are teachers who want to do some really good things, they want to do some innovative things, they just don't know how to and what technologies are out there to help them do that. And that's where our team, our ITC team as a whole come in, right? We go in and we help teachers kind of realize their dream for what they want their classrooms to look like. And so I think that's one of the exciting things about all these AI tools is how can teachers then leverage them to personalize the learning that they want to facilitate in their classrooms. Yeah, Bell Rose, I'm, uh, I'm just smiling as you talk about it. <laughs> like, uh, so in CarePod, when we think about this, we, we kind of split it into two parts where we think, of course, there's a billion other areas where AI can be helpful for teachers, but one is taking away the boring administrative things uh, which you don't really want to do and don't really contribute to the learning, but it might be important, but it can, can be optimized, be optimized. Uh, and then it's the other part, which is what you're talking about, Delros, which I think is, is the most interesting part where we're thinking about how can we amplify and give the teacher a superpower? How can you, how can we make, it, help the teacher kind of give their feedback to every single student and, and accomplish, uh, accomplish more without doing more? Uh, and I think that's the that's the really exciting part, and I think that's the uh, that's that's the part where like I get so much joy out of it and visiting classrooms, seeing teachers and students, and uh, yeah, and, uh, this was mentioned there before as well. This is kind of the worst versions of these products. We'll see, and uh, it's it's just going to get better. And I think educators, at least in our case, when we're building a product for educators specifically, like all the feedback we get uh, from teachers from students. That's also part of shaping the product. Um, so, yeah, no, lots of interesting opportunities around uh, around this. Yeah, I mean, I, the, the only thing I'd add is that, um, again, the capabilities are going to get very, very good. So, you know, it's not just that you'll have like a chat based tutor, but you could have, you know, an avatar, maybe even a lifelike avatar of LeBron James. Um, that's having a conversation with students, you know, helping them with their homework after school. Um, because the combination of, you know, generative video paired with, you know, you, you basically train the, the tutor, you know, you train on like a million hours of Khan Academy tutoring transcripts and you, you build this basically system that understands exactly how, uh, to guide students towards answers and you can adjust micro adjust based on progression you know like and, and would probably learn really quickly uh and be able to do that so um i mean it's not inconceivable that that from like a tutoring perspective the ai is gonna be you know exceed even what a very good you know uh live tutor can do um for something the, the challenge is that you do probably miss out on some of the subtleties of interaction with um adults and with people and so my you know my concern is it could be so useful that you you end up in this situation where you know you see like these almost dystopian images in china of like students in these giant you know um almost like warehouses and cubicles with headphones on um so i am a bit you know like i think there's there's probably gonna be a balance i don't i'm not so worried about that in the u.s but um I struggle a bit with like, I think it's going to be so useful. It's going to be so effective that you were going to be grappling with um, what it means more broadly. Um, yeah, definitely. And I saw Adam put in the chat what I was just about to jump in. <laughs> that sounded like Ready Player One. Um, yeah, so, so much that y'all have said. And um, I totally agree with that. Um, and I know that um, regarding AI, then 
then we've been using it for a long time in education in terms of personalized learning. Um, I remember back in 20, oh gosh, 2014, 2015, I had my students on one tool um, that would just kind of customize to their responses. And I know that now some standardized tests do that, you know, to just kind of level and things of that nature. Um, but when we're talking about personalization, then one point that Katie made in the chat that I really want to draw out is empowering uh, our students to create their own personalization um, and seeing how that might work because personalization is a lot more than just, you know, achievement mastery level. Um, it, you know, it can also integrate their likes, their dislikes, their their home culture. That's one, one part that's often lacking in the personalization process. So with, um, with AI, then this really empowers students to be able to do that and perhaps, you know, customize something that will give it to them the way that they learn best. Um, Alex was mentioning about like a LeBron James type uh, character uh, collaborating with students and chatting with them. That reminds me of a, a, a podcast I was hearing today and they were talking about character.ai. So I dropped that in the chat. I don't remember if that's the correct link or not. So forgive me if it's not, but there was something that lets you have a conversation with, um, they were saying on the podcast, any person alive or dead. I don't, I, I haven't really done my research on that, but um, if it lets you, you know, have a conversation with the celebrity, then when this hits the education market and they can outsource it, then that's definitely a, a viability. Um, and in addition to that, even with what we have available to us right now with GPT-4, um, one example I shared in the chat is that I have asked it to personalize my life for me. Um, for example, customize my macros that I want to hit every day based on information. And, and it even created like a video game narrative for my workouts at the gym. So it's, it's crazy what we can have this stuff do and how we want to learn, you know, how we want to be engaged. So I really, really love that comment from Katie. It's cool. You know, when I look at AI and AI machine learning, I think about something like Amazon, not Amazon, excuse me, um, Netflix. You watch Netflix shows, it tells you what should be the next show that you should watch as a consumer. But on the back end for Netflix, they know which shows are watched, which regions. They even have it down to a science to tell you how many seasons of a show they should make based on all this data and points that they've been able to pull in. So when I, the scary part that scares me, when I look at education, when you think of all the data points we have on our students, it, we know everything from when they were born, time of day, uh, who has allergies, who don't have allergies, how long it takes them to do certain math problems. So you really could get a truly customized, personalized plan for each kid. On the great, great side, yay. Scary side, that's a lot of information. That's a lot of things. When do we get to the point where instead of being predictive, it's now being manipulative, where that AI is now suggesting and making students do things? I mean, those are the things that scare me when I look at AI. So I said all that to say this, panelists. This is our last question that we're going to do. What excites you the most about AI? And what also concerns you the most about AI as we start moving forward into this next journey in education with AI? I'll go first. I think the exciting thing is because the user interface is so accessible, uh, anybody's going to be able to create and become a power user. And that's an opportunity that's never existed uh, since the dawn of the computer, because computers always had a barrier to entry. Um, so we have a big opportunity to uh, sort of rethink what digital equity really means and actually do something about it. Um, what scares me is um, just like with Google search and AdWords, people figured out how to game the system. Um, people are going to figure out how to once once the once the language models are connected to the Internet, people are going to figure out how to game the models. And, you know, hopefully the AI companies are ahead of the ball. but um, you know, I think within the next 12 months, we may need to assume that everything that we're reading online is um, potentially written by AI, especially not from trusted sources. And that raises the stakes on like digital literacy, and online citizenship and online safety uh, education. Yeah, I think um, to Alex's point, it's that the 
we've been talking about digital literacy for so many years and we're still talking about it at the same volume right so it's like is it is it happening and someone mentioned in the chat we need to really have moved from literacy to fluency at this point um but we're still talking about literacy and we're talking about it because there's still a need folks still there's still um illiterate folks out there um and and as ai come on board more and more right folks have to develop the skills educators and students adult and young learners consumers everyone have to develop the the agility to to navigate you know the misinformation to protect their digital privacy to it, it's all of that i i you know no surprise i'm an isti certified educator i'm going to give isti a plug and that digital literacy um portion of the portfolio it's it's deep and it's um it's designed to help educators to kind of interrogate their own attitudes about how do they deal with their personal information and what access do they give others to their personal information what trade-offs are they willing to make right to to get access to something and so i think to the extent what that we give young learners and this is cannot be a pocket or a part of an uh, an orientation right it has to be baked into the course it has to be something that's done in every content every day in some form right it has to be as important in the social studies content as the mayan empire or the aztec empire it has to be as important and the math curriculum as, as you know the algebraic equations and things so i think we have to get serious at, about these these literacies and, and and the level of fluency that we're developing in adult and young learners uh, daryl what were you saying about digital literacy i think i need to turn my volume up i didn't hear it i didn't hear it <laughs> i love that she's we've been saying it at the same volume y'all just ain't hearing us <laughs> Yeah, I'm over here cheering um, <laughs> as I'm hearing you speak, Del Rose. Um, 100%. So the literacy piece, uh, the fluency piece needs to definitely come into play. So for my answer to the question, I'll kind of flip it on its head. I'll go with the fear first and I'll end with what excites me. Um, so the fear is that um, is that instead of learning how to do things, that people may just go straight to the tool and um, you know have it spit out a response. And that might be their MO. Um, so there's that. And there's also the ability to abuse it and try to get it to, you know, give you the output that you want and, you know, that not necessarily being factual. However, what I would say is that when we do actually have a grasp on uh, what we're trying to do, whatever productivity we're trying to use it to amplify, it can make us better. Like, for example, you know, I'm an author, I'm a publisher, um, and we recently put together a compilation of, uh, of chapters of educators all over the United States. The book took my forward for the book. Uh, or I'm sorry, the, the technology took my forward for the book. And it made it so much better. <laughs> and it does the same thing with emails. And in doing that and in creating courses and things of that nature, then I'm becoming better at doing it because I'm seeing examples. Hey, this is, you know, I, I never thought of this. Okay, well, next time, you know, now I've learned something from the tool and this is actually helping me level up for uh, no money out of pocket. I don't want to say free because there's always a cost to everything, <laughs> but um, but it's helping me you know, it's helping me learn for right now, no money out of my pocket. So um, the productivity is on supercharge mode. Um, and also as a human being, just being able to learn different skills that we use in our life that may be part of our work, may not be part of our work. I'm a new mom. So I'm learning, you know, tips and tricks to help me to help me mom better, you know, by asking a question. So, um, so I, I'm really excited about the, the recent developments. I think I'll go with your model, Sarah, and start with the fair. <laughs> I think uh, my biggest fair would be what Alex was describing, that we end up in a situation where everyone are sitting alone with their own digital tutor, uh, just optimizing for uh, standards or grades. 
Uh, and my hope is the opposite end of the spectrum, that the introduction of AI will actually push us more towards 21st century skills. That is kind of, everyone now understands that, oh, wow, there's no point in just learning tons of and reciting tons of facts. You actually need to have critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, all of these, these skills. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm leaning towards that it's going in the hope direction. Let's see. <laughs> and as school leaders, I hope uh, you will be pushing it that way. And uh, then um, I will be doing my best part of that uh, from the vendor side. I thank you so much for sharing that. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, can you please give this amazing group of panelists a round of applause, round of applause, round of applause, round of applause, virtual round of applause. Don't unmute this virtual round of applause. There you go. <laughs> All right, real quick, real quick. Um, this is go down the line of the photos right there, uh, starting with Sarah. If you could tell everybody where they could find more about Sarah Thomas and what you're doing, and we're just going to go down the line, everybody, real quick. Let us know where we can find you and all your stuff. All right, totally. Yeah, I'm on all the socials at Sarah the Teacher, so you can find me there. You can also find me at sarahjanethomas.com, which is my website, or at edumatch.org, which is uh, edumatch's website. Yes, uh, you can find me at uh, curepod.com. Right in the chat, it's probably going to be doing the customer support, so you'll get to me. Uh, or uh, Jens at curepod.com. Send me an email if you have any questions. I want to connect there. And then on Twitter, I think I'm at Jens Seip. I'll write it in the chat. Excited to connect with everyone. Anyone who want to have a chat about AI or curiosity, critical thinking uh, in the classroom. And I am on Twitter at Atkinson underscore NBCT. If you'd like to follow me and see where um, where I'm headed. I, I also give a plug to the GM ISTE created AI course. So if you Google GM ISTE, um, that was my first entree into AI in, uh, in K-12. And so if you wanna learn, they're doing some really good things um, with that course, um, and GM supports it. So check it out. And if you want to learn more about how you can incorporate AI in your classroom, whether it, K-12 classroom, they have lessons from for elementary all the way to 12th grade. Yeah, and I put my, my LinkedIn and email in the chat. Um, all of our curriculum is free on our website, AIEDU.org. Um, so yeah, check it out. I would love, if you have any feedback, um, I'd love to hear it. And then we are uh, scheduling professional development, and we do have some scholarships available. Um, so if you have an interest in organizing some PD for your teachers, uh, we have two hour, four hour versions, half day, full day. Um, we're also building a, a how to, uh, basically how to use ChatGPT um, in partnership with OpenAI. So uh, if you're interested in any of that, just shoot us a note. Thank you once again for sharing. You said my favorite price, free 99. That's my favorite price for things. If those of you know me know that's my price. Uh, once again, thank you everybody for attending uh, today's uh, webinar. I wanna thank our friends at AWS for making this possible. Thank you, AWS. I also wanna give a shout out to everybody from the Future Ready Offer Ed team that is on the line. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for attending. A recording of this will be sent out. Thank you and have a great rest of your day.